to the Lord this morning to lead it in my life. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Thank God for being in the house of God one more time. Thank the Lord for you this morning. Thank God for our founder, our bishop, Dr. White. Amen. Amen. And I want to give honor to Bishop Edwards this morning, who I know is walking on streets of gold. She's probably shouting on the streets of gold this morning. I want to give honor to her this morning, who was a pastor for many years. And I hope y'all don't mind giving her honor this morning. And I thank God for her. She was such an influence on my life. And I met her many years ago. And, and then in 2005, she became my pastor. Amen. And then in 2012, we moved here. So she was my pastor for a long time. And I give honor to her this morning. And we are going to be in our outline. Um, Jesus makes the decision to come down to redeem man. One thing I knew about Bishop Edwards, she believed in the existence of the God he had bodily. And she believed how... God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit were three different individuals, three separate, three separate beings, and how she made Jesus Christ so real to me in the person of being the Word. And this morning we're going to be in our outline title, Jesus Makes the Decision to Come Down to Redeem Man. And I remember one time she was preaching and she began to preach about him. Pastor Harris probably remembers this very vividly. And she made Jesus Christ so re much, much realer than I ever realized in my whole life that he was. And she was teaching about and preaching rather about how he took captivity captive. And I've been teaching um, a couple of Sundays about how it is so important to realize how Jesus Christ existed before he was a baby in, my, in Mary's womb. Because when you believe on Jesus, as the scripture has said, that he was the word and um, that he existed with God the Father and the Holy Ghost in the beginning, which is the dateless past, then that gives power not only does it give you power, but it shows that you recognize the power of God. And when you recognize the power of God by the Holy Spirit, that unlocks the door for you to receive power. It gives you the opportunity to receive what you never had before. And when she was preaching about Jesus Christ and how he took captivity captive when he went into the lower parts of the earth, and he took the keys and she did a she did a motion and she she did it like he snatched the keys from Satan. And then she just did like that real quick and she snatched the key, he snatched the keys from Satan, she said. And at that moment things changed for the people of God and they were able to be led um, into heaven because they had been captive so long, not tormented, but separated from God. And I want to encourage you as we go into this teaching this morning, lesson Jesus makes a decision to come down to redeem man. Um, and we're going to be in section two, which says there was a conversation in heaven about Jesus coming down to redeem man. And um, when there was this conversation, and I want to make sure that I give you what the Spirit had given me to give to you. I'm going to tie this into our memory verse. Um, and before we get any further, let's go to the memory verse in Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians 2. And we're going to go to verse 5. Amen. Is anyone available to recite Philippians 2 and 5? If not, we will read it together. Amen. Amen. We're going to read it together. Amen. If you are there, signify by saying amen. Philippians 2, 5. We're going to read through verse 11. Amen. Amen. All together. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was <clears throat> made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I thank the Lord for the word of God today because um, this word has really um, taken hold in my spirit. And that's why I'm here today. And it, Bishop Ed was, was an integral part of that. And over in the lesson on number two, there was a conversation in heaven about Jesus coming down to redeem man. And we're going to tie this into the memory verse. It says, this conversation was between God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And as this relates to our memory verse, and I'm going to turn back to verse five, where it talks about, let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. And there was a conversation in heaven about Jesus coming down to redeem man. And it wasn't a conversation that was just um, kind of like a fly-by-night conversation because God knew Jesus' reputation when he was in heaven as the word. And because he knew his reputation in heaven as the word, God knew that when he was looking for someone to... Um, go to be the sacrifice for mankind. He knew that because of Jesus' reputation that he could trust Jesus to go and fulfill his will. Amen. So when we look at this scripture, let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, I know I'm not making a lot of traction in the Christian education outline, but the outline this one the week before, and they're all very rich. Um, but the Lord has really been hovering over, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and drilling down and, and honing in on what this mind really is. There's so much complexity into it, but the Bible says that the way is so plain that a fool need not err. And when I say complexity, it's not just a one and done. It's not complex to the point where you can't get it, but it's not just a one and done. Because when you read the word of God, more and more revelation should come as the spirit leads and reveals. Amen. And so when we look at there was a conversation in heaven about Jesus come down to redeem man. It says the conversation was between God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. In that conversation, it was decided that Jesus was going to come down. Turn over to Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, and we will go back to Philippians in just a moment. So Hebrews 10 five through seven Hebrews 10 if I could have a reader Hebrews 10 five through seven actually I want you to read to nine and actually 10 so Hebrews 10 five through 10 amen Hebrews the 10th chapter Five through ten reads, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, and saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then I then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may abolish the second. By the which 
will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. So we see here, good morning. So we see here that, um, do we have any additional outlines? Yes, definitely. Amen. So we see here that when we look at Jesus Christ, and Paul is explaining this to the Hebrews, that when we look at Jesus Christ, one of the key things that he said here was that he came to do whose will? God's will. Say it a little bit louder. God's will. So Jesus came to do God's will. Amen. This is Christian education, brothers. So we have service after this. So he's going to get y'all an outline. Um, and so he came to do God's will. And so when we look at Philippians 2 and 5, our memory verse, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. So when you look at the mind of Christ, first thing that he said over in the book of Hebrews, and Paul is just quoting and saying this, he's saying that I came to do thy will. And Jesus had told him, you know, that you prepare a body for me. But after that, after he came down and he divested himself of his immortal body, and he was born and agreed to be born of the Virgin Mary. Then he said, now I, I'm, go I'm going for a purpose. And that purpose is to do God's will. It's not to do anything else, but it's to do the will of God. And a lot of times, you know, I've heard people over my life and even over my career, and they would say, um, you know, they'll say, I, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find myself. I'm searching for this. I'm searching for that. But at the end of the day, when I used to hear people say that, and this is before I knew the Lord, um, I would begin to say within myself, then, yeah, why are we here? Why are we here? And then when the Lord began to draw me by his Holy Spirit, I began to think about the fact that once I was introduced to Christ via the Holy Spirit, then I began to think about, I know why I'm here now. I'm here for the same purpose that Paul just explained that Jesus said, which is, I come to do thy will. And it takes a mind, the mind of Christ, as Philippians, the second chapter talks about, it takes that mind to know that you're here for a purpose, not for yourself. And that takes a lot of humbling and, or humility because a lot of times when we are growing up, we are conditioned to do and get ours, right? We're conditioned to go forth to get ours, to do what we need to do to make it in this world because we don't know how much time we got here, right? We just lost a legend in the Church of Living God on Friday night, and she was a legend, Amen. And, um, and I say that not lightly, but she was a soldier in the army of the Lord. And so this 80 plus years that she was here, she recognized, and as my pastor for 10 years, she, she helped me to recognize that I was here to do the will of God through the word of God. Not just because she told me, not just because she believed it, but because it's God's will to know that I'm here to do his will. I'm going to say that again. It's God's will to know, for me to know, for all of us to know, that we are here to do his will. And some may say, well, you know, that's, a, a sister pastor, that's a little bit uh, selfish, if you would. But God, the creator of all things, he's been around since the dateless past. And so since it is his good pleasure, the Bible says, then it's up to him to decide what it is that I'm supposed to do while I'm here. Because I'm here because of him. And not only because of him, but I'm here for him. So it, it would behoove me to have the mind that Philippians 2 and 5 says, let this mind be in me or be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Because everything since the dateless past, since the beginning, I don't know when the dateless past started, but it's dateless. But everything from that time going forward, it was according to the will of God. 
And so because it's according to the will of God, I have an option. I can say I, I want to have this mind that Philippians 2 and 5 is talking about. Or I can say I don't want this mind and I can um, be rewarded with that, whatever that reward would be that is not of the will of God. And there's only two options. There's either heaven or there's hell. There's only two options. And a lot of times people don't talk about that now because they might be concerned about their church being full. But I always tell y'all that um, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And it's about the fact that souls need to be, as First Peter talks about, there needs to be an abundant entrance into the kingdom. Not, be, not by volume of people, but by pureness of soul. And the only way that you make it to heaven is by doing the will of God. And how can you do the will of God? Anybody? How? What helps you to do the will of God? It is the Holy Spirit. I cannot do the will of God without the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives me the mind of Christ. So any other mind that I have, even if it's my own mind, I have to examine myself, and the Bible says examine yourself whether you be in the faith. I have to examine myself, whose mind am I working with? Whose mind am I working through? Whose mind am I working for? Whose mind? Because that helps me to understand my trajectory. If I don't have the mind of Christ, and there's telltale signs when we don't have the mind of Christ. Sometimes we might not be walking in the spirit or by the Holy Spirit because certain decisions that we make, we, we fail to ask ourselves, what would the spirit lead and guide us to do by the direction of Jesus Christ and God the Father? If I make certain decisions, did I have the mind of Christ given to me by the Holy Spirit in those decisions? Did I pray about those decisions and be led into those decisions? Or did I just do what I wanted to do? Amen? So it's, it's real deep about having this Philippians 2 and 5 mind. It's deeper than what we, we talk about. Because a lot of times I would read the scripture without the Spirit helping me. Because I didn't have him when I first started out. And I would read the scripture, and I would read the scripture, and I would read the scripture, and it sounded good because I thought I was having the mind just by reading the scripture. But the mind comes, somebody say the mind comes, when the Holy Spirit gives it to you. You can't have, it's not like in the world, you can have a lot of stuff in the world with, on your own, and you can go out and do X, Y, and Z, but when it comes to spiritual things, they have to be given to you. Amen? They have to be given to you. I, we, we came down here and started this church a couple years ago. I didn't have this mind to start this church until the Spirit gave it to me. Because I could have stayed in Bloomington. Or I could have stayed in the military. I could have stayed in the Air Force Reserve. I could have stayed in the Army. I could have did all these things. But everything pertaining to the spiritual things should be given by the Holy Spirit. So that all goes back to having this mind, letting this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Because if they don't, there are repercussions. There are things that can happen when I'm trying to do a spiritual work without the Holy Spirit. Anybody want to give me some examples? Things, Certain things can happen when I'm trying to do a spiritual work without the Holy Spirit. I'll give you an example. There's a scripture that says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. But doing a spiritual work without the Holy Spirit gives you leave to end up being weary in well-doing. Because even when you have the Holy Spirit, sometimes you might, if you're not praying and fasting and reading your word, you might find yourself getting a little tired just because you're in this mortal body. But without the Holy Spirit, imagine doing a spiritual work without help because the Holy Spirit is our help. And guess what? You, get, you are prone to burning out faster 
without the spirit. Yes, sir. And another thing that happens when you try to do a spiritual work without the Holy Spirit is there's no evidence of change in people's lives. And that's what it was for me all those years in church without the Holy Ghost. And there was no change in my life, the same situations. And I began to wonder why was I going to church at all? But it was because the, the work was being done or the preaching and the teaching and everything, like me singing songs and all these wonderful promises, but no Holy Spirit there to do the work. And so that ties into your weary and well-doing. Like even in myself at the time, not being a pastor, I got weary with coming to church. Why should I keep coming? So that well-doing of even coming to church was just a start for all of us without the Holy Spirit. Not only do we not see a change in our lives, but after a while we give up. We give up. That's a, that's a result of trying to do. So it's so important to not underestimate what this mind of Christ Jesus is. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who strengthens you and helps you to continue on. You know, we can have our own stamina to a certain point. Right? I can do X, Y, and Z to a certain point. But after a while, if I don't have what I need in order to do what I need to do, guess what? I'm going to fold. I'm going to collapse. I'm going to do some. I'm going to do something. Something's going to wane. Something's going to be let go. So I want to encourage you this morning that this mind of Christ is real deep. Not deep where you can't understand it, but there's so much to this letting this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. But it starts with having, asking, receiving, believing, allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and fill and flood your spirit. And when you don't have him, you need him. And if you have them, you need more. It's not like you fill up your gas tank and you're going to run on that gas forever. At some point in time, you're going to have to go fill that tank back up. Amen? some point in time, you're going to need to go put some gas in. And it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. You still need to seek more and more of the Holy Spirit. Just because you received him doesn't mean that you don't need to be filled and refilled over and over again. So that you can continue on in having the mind of Christ. And then when you have the mind of Christ, then you are able to effectively do the work of Christ. And you may say, well, I see people doing the work of Christ all the time without the Holy Spirit. That may be true, but the end result, because we haven't seen the end yet, that's the key. Because we don't know what their reward will be. I don't know what yours is going to be. You, you don't know what mine's going to be. We pray we all get the reward of what we got on this sign, heaven. Our passion, our mission, our goal. That's what all the labor's about. It's not because, you know, we want to come in and dress up and get up early and do all this stuff just because we want to be seen. No, it's because heaven is the reward. And so at the end of the day, because sometimes we're short-sighted, we look at things right now, but we don't look at the end game, the end goal. And when you have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will help you look down the line. He'll help you look past some doors right there. He'll help you look past our uh, hearties over there. He'll help you look way down the line so that you can see yourself however long that you are alive on this earth. We didn't know we was going to lose our great bishop on Friday night. But the 80 plus years that she was here, she was able to look down the line to know that when she closed her eyes for the last time, she would be walking on streets of glory. And that's what the mind of Christ will do for you. It will help you to understand that there's so much more to you and life than just right now. Because we live in the moment in the natural body. But the Holy Spirit helps you to look beyond that. So that way, at the end of the day, when you close your eyes, you already know. There's no doubt. There's no confusion. There's no uncomfortability. You already know. Because the Holy Spirit has been abiding, dwelling, and residing in you, you already know that if, if you don't make it out the building, guess what? you're going to walk on streets of glory. That's what the mind of Christ does for you. And it changes your trajectory where it's not about just getting the next this or the next dollar or the next job or the next this and that and the other. In the natural, although the Bible says occupy till he comes. 
The Bible says that. It says occupy till he comes. So that means we got to build houses. We got to get jobs. We got to do all the stuff to maintain and sustain ourselves. But in the, at the end of the day, that's all temporary stuff. Amen. It's all fleeting. It's all fleeting. Solomon talked about that in Ecclesiastes. It's just vanity. It's all vanity. You lose a house, you get another. You lose a place, you get another. You lose a job, you get another. This stuff is fleeting. It just temporary fixes, temporary th excuse me, things to hold us over till we get to the real thing. Somebody said the real thing. Which is a real place. Somebody said it's a real place. And it's called heaven. So don't hang your hat on stuff down here. Too long we've been conditioned to do that, to hang our hat on things down here. There's a song that says, um, uh, hold on to his hand, God's unchanging hand. You better build your hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Then another part of that song says, life is filled with swift transitions. Amen. None on earth can move and move can stand. It says, build your hope on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. You can hold on to a job if you want to. I don't have a lot of them. They come and go. But the mind of Christ will tell you, yeah, I'm on this job every day, but uh, I really know where I'm going in the end. I'm going to do what I need to do down here. But in the end, heaven is not. You got to think to this regard. I'm going to move on. Have the mind of Christ so much so that regardless of how everything going in life and you going through life every day, but have the mind of Christ so or desire it so until God give it to you by his spirit that you have the mind of Christ so that heaven is not too far from your mind. If you got to reach real, 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 real far to, to, for heaven to come to your mind, that tells you where you are spiritually. Amen. That tells you where you are spiritually. And it's not a, a, a thing to cause anyone to be condemned. But it's to help us to grow and understand where we are in our walk with Christ. Amen. So we have to know where we are with our walk with Christ. Um, I'm going to go back over a couple of scriptures. Amen. Go back to Philippians this morning. And the second part of this lesson this morning, I want to encourage you, as Philippians is talking about letting this mind be in us, Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Um, and it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not Robert to be equal with God. You know, they knew about Jesus. I was starting off saying this. In heaven, they knew who Jesus was when he was in heaven as the word. And he had a reputation when he was in heaven. And his reputation was that whatever God the Father wanted, God the Father got it. He was known as the word, as John 1 talks about. And even in Genesis, it talks about in the first chapter in the beginning. And different other scriptures in Hebrews talks about how he was there in the beginning. And so as I started off, he said, even in Hebrews, that he was to do the will of God. Jesus' reputation when he came to earth as well as when he was in heaven as the word, from beginning to end to now, he is known to do the will of God. So I ask a question to you this morning. What are you known for? And you don't have to answer it to me. But it's something about having a reputation because a reputation is how you're known. And here's the thing about a reputation, as Philippians is talking about. Just because you don't know your reputation doesn't mean other people don't know your reputation. I'm going to say that again. Just because you don't know your reputation doesn't mean other people don't know your reputation. When Jesus decided when he was the word to come down, don't you know that everybody in heaven already knew he was the most qualified one to go to redeem us from our sins? Everybody in heaven was already, they were on the same page. I do believe that there was no dissenters and there was no one who was challenging that. If it was, okay, I'm going to use my Holy Ghost imagination. I had read it. But I don't believe there was a problem when he decided that he was going to go when that conversation happened. 
I don't believe there was a problem. Why? They trusted him based upon what? His reputation. What is our reputation? And I'm not just talking about our spiritual reputation, our, our natural reputation. What is our reputation in heaven? Because at the end of the day, we want to be known in heaven by what we do down here. Amen? We want to be known in heaven about what we do and how we live and how we worship God down here. Amen. And so when we look at this word reputation about how we're known and who we're known of and all these different things, um, it says being in the form of God in verse 6 in Philippians, he had the same type of immortal body that God had. He had, he was, he had power just like God had, but he made himself of no reputation. And that was something key to God that he didn't take the time to say, well, look now, you know, some of us would be like, look, um, I got just as much authority as you do. And um, for me to go down and become one of them, and that means I have to subject myself to mortality, and I got to be hungry when I'm hungry and feel cold and this, that, and the other sickness. I'm subject to all the things that mankind is subject to. But in Hebrews, we read earlier, he said that, no, he prepared him a body, meaning an immortal body, or a mortal body, a body that could feel just like we do. And if we think about that, that was a lot to take on, to divest yourself, humble yourself, give up everything that you knew to be real, to come to a place where it was unknown to you, to live in a body. Think about this, to live in a body that was unknown to him. Because all he knew was being in heaven as the word. All he knew was immortality. So to divest himself and to say, I'm coming down in a body just like theirs. He did that and made himself of no reputation. When he was doing it, he wasn't walking around heaven with a flag saying that I'm going down. He wasn't walking around with a banner boasting about it. But he made himself of no reputation. That conversation between him, God, him, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit... He just told him he would come down. And everything else that we read about when we look at Jesus' life and his works, it wasn't about a reputation. It was about us. It was about us. What does our lives depict? Who is it about? Yes, sir. And he made himself a no reputation so much so that even when people try to to give him praise and glory, he would say, no, I'm about my father's business. He would always turn it around to, to have people to look to God. He would say, if you've seen me, you've seen God. He, he's always, Jesus always wanted the people to think about God. And it, it made me think about when you say, well, what are we known for? Do people, you know, do we try to get people to think about God? Do we try to get people to think about heaven? And what are we really doing with our life? And so Jesus always wanted people to know that he wasn't about his business. Even when he was 12, he said, you know, I'm about the father's business. It's not about me. So he always wanted to turn the people's attention from himself to God or from himself and the things that he was doing on this earth to them going to heaven. So everything that he did, he didn't want the reputation to be about himself, but he wanted it to be about God. He wanted it to be about heaven. He wanted it to be about salvation. And, some, and, and thank you for bringing those points out. What are we known for? Not just down here. Because a lot of us know what our reputation is down here. A lot of us know. There may be some times that we don't know everything because we don't know what other people think about us, right? But this reputation is a big deal. In heaven, what is my reputation? Yes, I believe my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But what am I known for? Don't you know that when Bishop Edwards got to heaven Friday night, they already knew who she was? They already knew who she was. Why? Her name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, first of all. But then everything that she was doing up until that point, guess what? They already had heard about it. Don't you know, I always say this, and, and Pastor Harris brought it out recently. Everybody going to heaven, but everybody ain't going to stay. And people never liked that years ago when the Spirit revealed it to me when I would say that. 
Why? Because if I'm not living the life that the Lord would have me to live, he's going to tell me, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? How can he say that? Why? Because he knew my reputation. He knew me. He knew of me. He knew of the works that I did and did not do. So this reputation is a big thing that we really have to focus on. I don't care what people think about me down here to a certain point, right? You have to care to a certain point. But at the end of the day, the most important reputation as it relates to this Bible in Philippians, specifically in the second chapter and fifth verse, is the reputation that you got in heaven. Because that's the only reputation that's really going to matter because that reputation takes you from earth to glory. And then it causes you to have where your reward is going to be, whether in heaven or in hell. So a lot of times we got things twisted. We focusing on the wrong reputation. Because at the end of the day, when we close our eyes, people going to move on with life. And that might be a hard saying for some, but the reputation that I have is going to remain here. The reputation in heaven will as well. But because my final destination is not this earth, I need to be concerned about the reputation for the place that I'm going to be. And if I focus my efforts on that reputation, building that reputation up in a good way, then when I see Jesus, I will hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rule over many. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That statement is reserved for those who have a reputation of having the mind and the life of Christ, which is given by the Holy Spirit. And I keep talking about the Holy Spirit because in this day and age, it's not a lot of emphasis put on the Holy Spirit, but the Bible is littered with references and scriptures about the Spirit because he's the one that 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13 talks about. Your body will not be changed without him. When he comes on the cloud, when we talk about the rapture, when he comes on the cloud, he's looking, God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they are looking for those who are known in heaven for having the Holy Spirit and did the work accordingly. And when I say work, it's not about, oh, you see me cleaning the church. You see me, you know, uh, paying whatever tithes. You see me doing such and such. But my work, first and foremost, is just to live holy. Everything else is extra. Everything else is a bonus. And it's, it, it goes along with the mind of Christ, but the baseline is just for me to live holy as, as he was holy. That's the baseline. Everything else go up from there. So I want to encourage you this morning in Christian education. What is your reputation in heaven? What does God think about you? Don't matter what I think. What is God's, what, what, what does, what is written in either the books or the Lamb's book of life? Which book are we in? That also is uh, indicative of reputation. Because if I'm not living holy, guess what? My name ain't in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible says the way is so plain that a fool need not err. It is not confusing on which book I'm in, unless I want to be. But it's all about what's my reputation. Let this mind be in you. And we define let. Let is an allowing. It's, it's to give permission. It's to provide opportunity. Let is a small word. It is to give use of. I'm just resurfacing this from previous weeks. It's to award or authorize or to lease out. So if I'm letting the mind be in me, I'm giving or conceding, I'm endorsing, and I'm enabling this mind to be in me. Because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself in. So I got to let him. Amen? So I want to encourage you, as I'm ramping, ramping down this morning, this mind of Christ is a mind that we have to realize that it's not something that we can just go out and get, but we have to ask for it. And I didn't know that for a long time. I didn't know I needed to ask for the mind. Because I just thought, you know, I was going to church and I was good. But I really, really had to ask God to give me the same mind that Jesus had. 
that's when my life started to change. I'm going to tell y'all, I was in a lot of churches before I came to the Church of Living God International. I was in a big church, smaller church. I didn't grow up in church, though, even though my great-grandma had a church in her backyard. But I knew one thing for sure. I knew I wasn't living right. And I knew that I didn't have the mind of Christ, even though I didn't know the scripture. And at the time, I didn't even want the mind of Christ. But I wanted a change. I want to encourage you as I'm wrapping down, in order to have the change that Pastor Harris was talking about, the change comes with the mind. I'm circling back to where I began. The change comes with the mind. If you wonder, because I was wondering when I was in those other places, why can't I live free from sin? keep on saying I can live free from sin. I keep on doing the same thing over and over. Why can't I live free from sin? I didn't have the Holy Spirit. And when I didn't have the Holy Spirit, I didn't have the mind. This sounds redundant, but it's necessary because of the need to change. The mind helps us to change. So I want to encourage you this morning from Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And be concerned, if you're going to be concerned about anything, what God thinks about you. It is all about that reputation. Amen. Amen. That's all I have for you. I have a couple of reviews this morning.